A huge thanks to Brian for sponsoring this video. Good morning, fellow mathematicians! Welcome back to new episode of Mathematics Gone Wrong Done Right. And it has been a while since the last video in the series and I'm really excited to present to you this variant of the problem that I have released a few days prior to this video. Last time we have discussed when is the cosine of x equal to the cosine of 1 of x. That was already in and of itself very interesting. But today a different question. When is the cosine of 1 of x equal to 1 over the cosine of x? This is something that my students actually get wrong from time to time and it makes me very angry. So don't do that mistake. But if you do the mistake then do it right and find the correct x values. Shall we? So definitely make sure to um, try it out for yourself and post your solution down there below. By the way, recently I created a new channel. It's a cooking channel, NP Cooking, and it's not your regular one. It's, it's kind of a knockoff of Future Canoe. It's, it's, it's just fun. Check it out. I have a lot of fun with those videos and you will notice that in those. Check it out. Subscribe to the channel. Even if you're not into cooking, you are going to enjoy those videos if you enjoy my regular content. So definitely make sure to check it out and support the new channel this way. And now we are going to dive right in. So cosine of 1 over x is equal to 1 over the cosine of x. So, so, one, of the, so, <laughs> so 1 over the cosine of x is nothing other than the secant of x, which doesn't make any sense when you think about it linguistically, because it should be the cosecant, probably be because of the other. This is a different story and a story that I hate to discuss. But other than that, how can you proceed with a problem like this? So the first thing we want to do is we want to see how the cosines are actually bounded. Because this already gives us an understanding of if there do even exist intersection points between those two functions. And if there are any, where would they be? So if you take a look at the regular cosine, doesn't matter which argument for now, the cosine is going to be bounded between 1 and negative 1. This is just how the cosine has been defined on the unit circle. Unit circle radius 1. So the cosine of 1 over x, doesn't matter which argument right here at the moment or what the function looks like, it's going to be bounded between 1 and negative 1. Now let us take a look at 1 over the cosine of x. As mentioned before, cosine of x is bounded between 1 and negative 1. So for example, the cosine of x is less or equal than 1. Now what about 1 over the cosine of x? Let us just take the inverse on both sides or the reciprocal on this order relation. Supplying us with um, 1 over the cosine of x is going to be naturally greater or equal to 1. Um, just take a look at this example if you can follow right now. So 1 half is less or equal to 1. But if we take the reciprocal on both sides, we are going to get that 2 is greater or equal to 1 over 1, which is 1. Same thing here. So 1 over the cosine of x is suddenly greater or equal to 1. Um, and if we have the same thing with uh, less or equal to negative 1, if we take the reciprocal now, we are going to get that the 1 over the cosine of x is actually less or equal to negative 1. So the sequence right here that we are going to get is going to totally avoid everything in the boundaries of cosine of 1 over x, except for when it is equal to 1. This is the only option. So this right here is, is bounded between 1 and negative 1, but this right here is totally outside of 1 and negative 1. It's either above the function or below the function when you consider the y-axis. The only times they could possibly meet is at 1. So this whole thing can only work out if both of those are equal to 1. And this gives us a system of two equations, basically. Namely, that the cosine of 1 over x is equal to 1, uh, on plus or minus 1, I'm sorry for that, plus or minus 1, obviously, or um, what cosine, no, 1 over the cosine of x is equal to plus or minus 1. And 1 over the cosine of x being equal to plus or minus 1 just gives us the same thing if we take the reciprocal. So we can just take this away. Um, okay, so we can start solving this equation. Now you just need to think about when, for example, cosine of x 
equal to plus or minus one. This always happens when our value in here, so x, is a multiple of here we have zero, then negative one is at par, then plus one is at two par and so on. Whenever x is just a multiple of par where the multiple means out of the positive or negative integers. So we can apply the inverse cosine, for example, on this equation um, under this condition. When x is equal to um, n times par, where n is element of the positive or negative integers, we get cosine of x being equal to plus or minus 1. The same thing we have up here. Every time 1 over x is equal to a multiple of par, we get that cosine of 1 over x is equal to plus or minus 1. Okay, um, and I think you can already see the problem here. That doesn't work out, but let us just really quickly solve this. So we could substitute, for example, the x into here, um, meaning we are going to get that um, this only holds if 1 over n times par is equal to k times par, meaning overall 1 must be equal to n times k times par squared. Mm. So it starts already with par not being a fraction. Just doesn't work out. This right here is part of the positive and negative integers and there's also smiley face now. <laughs> so this can never be equal to 1. It just doesn't work out because n times k can never be the multiplicative inverse of par squared. And with that we're done. There are no solutions and if you take a look at the graph you can see that even though here it seriously looks like we have intersection points, infinitely many, but they don't. If you zoom in, you are going to see it's not going to work out. Okay, we are done with that. Now, this was the cosine. What about the sine, for example? Well, with the sine, if we do the same thing, sine of 1 over x is equal to 1 over the sine of x, it's actually pretty similar. The only thing that is changing on this system of equations, so the boundaries are totally the same, it's, it's completely the same argument. The only thing that is changing here is that we don't have 1 over x being equal to k times par, for example, and x being equal to n times par. No, for the sine it's going to change in time a little bit because um, when do we get plus or minus 1 on the sine? We get it on par over 2, we get it on 3 par over 2, 5 par over 2 and so on. So this only holds for um, 1 over x being equal to 2k plus 1 over 2 times par and x being equal to 2n plus 1 over 2 times par. So the, the odd half integer multiples of par, basically. And if you plug the thing in, you are going to see it's not going to work out. And with the graph of the sine of 1 over x and the cosecants of x, it becomes very clear that it just doesn't work out, even more clear than with the cosine of x. There is no debate that this just doesn't work out. Um, and if you are wondering about the point 0, 1 that you get right in the middle, the limit does not exist when x goes to 0 neither on the sine of 1 over x nor the cosine of 1 over x. I explained this in the video before, it just starts oscillating heavily and for um, the argument of the sine and the cosine going to positive or negative infinity, it diverges because even though it's bounded between 1 and negative 1, we cannot decide which value it takes at infinity. Um, in German, this is what it's called um, unbestimmte divergenz. Maybe it's indeterminate divergence in English. I think it's only called divergence. So we got the cosine and the sine. But here's where it becomes a bit more interesting. Namely, when is the tangent of 1 over x equal to 1 over the tangent of x? Now you might think, well, Papa Flemmy, obviously no solution exists. But you would be wrong on this one. Try it out before you keep watching the video. This is actually nice. Um, the tangent, cool thing about this is that we can express it as the sine over the cosine. And here we take the reciprocal on the cotangent, giving us overall that the sine of 1 over x divided by the cosine of 1 over x is equal to, and here we take the reciprocal as before mentioned, cosine of x divided by the sine of x. And now what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the fractions, leaving us overall with sine of x 
times sine of one over x is equal to, oh, I'm already smiling, cosine of x times the cosine of one over x. Now you might already see something. If you are familiar with trigonometric identities, you are gonna think, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Now what we're gonna do is we are gonna subtract this part on both sides, giving us something of the form zero being equal to the cosine of a times the cosine of b minus the sine of a times the sine of b. Now this right here, is nothing other than the good old addition formula or subtraction formula. No, it's, it's the addition formula, I'm, I'm sorry, for the cosine. I have derived those before using matrices. Check out my complex numbers, but different series, maybe there is a link down there in the description. This right here is just addition formula for the cosine, giving us with cosine of x plus one over x being equal to zero overall. And this is actually very nice to solve. So when exactly is the cosine of any argument equal to zero? Well, <laughs> why not take a look at this graph once again? We get it at pi over two, uh, da, da, three pi over two, uh, da, da, five pi over two, and so on. So this time we get our argument x plus one over x to be of the form two k plus one over two pi, just like we had before with the sine. But this time our cosine is gonna result in zero then if we were to add this argument to our function. Meaning, if we apply the inverse cosine on both sides, we get a solution to this only if x plus one over x is of the form two k plus one over two times pi, where k is element of the positive and negative integers. For now, I'm gonna give this thing a different name because this is kind of annoying to write out. So now, once again, we can start solving an equation here, which is very easy to do. We can subtract a on both sides, giving us x minus a plus one over x is equal to zero. And we can multiply both sides by x under the condition that it's not equal to zero. And it can't be because the tangent of one over x when it approaches zero is also indeterminate once again. So um, it, it diverges. So we are gonna get that x squared, then we get um, negative a times x plus one is equal to zero. And that's a very easy quadratic equation to solve. If we were to solve this, we are gonna get this, the two solutions to our last problem right here are gonna be of the form a divided by two plus or minus the square root of a over four minus one. And if we substitute our a in, which is nothing other than the odd half multiples odd half integer multiples of pi. <laughs> we are gonna get, that, that's a mouthful actually. We are gonna get that this is um, 2k plus one over four plus or minus the square root of, um, here we are gonna get a squared, I'm terribly sorry. Um, if we get a squared, we are gonna get, and I also forgot a pi here, plus or minus, um, 2k plus one squared times pi squared divided by, and we get a four because of the square, four times four is 16, and then minus one. And this right here is the solution to our less problem. And it looks extremely ugly, but it gives us the right results. Take a look at that. You see, there are infinitely many solutions at that. So we can clearly see this from the graph. You don't need to take a look at this for very long to see that we get infinitely many solutions here. And those are gonna be expressed by this abomination. But it's cool that we can figure out something like this. And mathematics is a great tool to do exactly that. Doesn't matter if it's physics, you wanna dive into or chemistry. Mathematics is everywhere. And if you wanna dive more into the secrets of mathematics, everything that's behind it, and also other STEM fields, then I invite you to try out the contest of today's sponsor, Brand, who are kind enough to sponsor yet another video here on this channel. Ooh, that was a fun problem. And graphically, it's very easy to see that for the first two problems, we could have just not gone ahead and even tried to solve something. It's obvious that it does not work out, except for the last problem. That's actually something that you can solve numerically, algebraically, but also graphically if you wish. And solving things graphically and learning by doing is exactly what Brilliant is there for. If you are an avid enjoyer of mathematics problems, physics problems, or anything in the STEM field, then the contents of Brilliant might be definitely the perfect fit for you. 
And as mentioned previously, it really doesn't matter what you want to learn in which kind of STEM field, be it mathematics, physics, computer science, chemistry, no matter what it is. Brain definitely got something up their sleeve for you that you can play around with to get a better understanding of something that you want to learn of today. And if you're not yet familiar with Brain, let me introduce you to their course concept just for a second. So basically you choose a topic, for example, general relativity. And in normal case, they start off with something um, basic, like giving you an understanding of special relativity, for, for example. It's, it's, it's not very basic, but it's what, what comes before general re relativity and also tensors and also vectors. And once you gone ahead and have those few practice things out of the way to brush up of topics that you should be familiar with for now, then they get into the real flesh of the topic. And in the only case, if you reach that part of the courses, then everything will be underlined heavily with graphics, visualizations that you can play around with to get a better understanding of the problems at hand. And their visuals are amazing because they are highly interactive. If you want to learn something about a graph a bit more, then you take a lever, for example, and shove it around. See what the parameters do to a function, how they transform it, for example. And there's so much more. You should just try it out for yourself and see for yourself if this is something that could tickle your toes, your mathematical and also STEM toes, by using my link at the top of the description, brain the log slash mess. With it, you are going to get a 30 day free trial of awesomeness, which is amazing. You can try the whole landscape of brain for completely free and see if it could be something for you for a long-term relationship between you and also Preant. And then you can seriously make use of the link and then you get 20% of an annual premium subscription, which is an amazing deal considering how much content they already have available on their website and how much content they're adding on a regular basis. There's not much more to say. The only thing you should do is try it out now and see if it's something for you. And if it is, then definitely make sure to stay on Preant for a long time and support the channel this way and also your brain. This really gets your brain going. It's an awesome site and I really love it and I love that they sponsor this channel. So I hope you did enjoy this video and if it is, make sure to also subscribe to NP Cooking and up and take some video. I wish you guys a flimble day. See ya.